Old School Lame Casual Chats is brought to you by Old School Lame, producing various content from blogs, videos, and podcasts discussing about movies, TV shows, video games, and everything else in between since 2011. You can check out the podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, Overcast, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and YouTube. We're associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Aaron Meta Show. Welcome to a new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and uh, I am here with a very special guest, uh, one that we interviewed almost close to a decade ago, but uh, it's very nice to come back to discuss about all the stuff that he's doing nowadays. Um, he you know, was the founder of Frederator Studios, and now he's on his new uh, company, Fred Films. We had Fred uh, Seibert. So welcome, Fred. Hey, Patricia. Thanks for having me again. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you for coming on by. I really do appreciate this as well. So yeah, if you are interested in checking out the um, interview that we did almost a decade ago, I'll leave a link in the description below. Uh, we talked about various things from how you got your start in MTV and Nickelodeon, uh, your uh, discussion about being the president of Hanna-Barbera at the time, as well as uh, some of the stuff that you were working on with uh, Channel Frederator and Frederator Studios. So this is more like an updated version of- It's good because you know, I'm so old now that I forget all that stuff. So it's good we got it on tape then. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but now I actually want to talk to you about all the stuff that you're doing currently, like a bit of an update, uh, you know, of all the stuff that you've been doing since then. So mm -hmm. I want to know about Fred Film. So you had decided that you were going to start off this new division. So where did the idea of it come from? Well, basically, I had formed a partnership uh, up in Canada with a company called Wow. Actually, I started Wow with a partner up in Canada, put Frederator in there. Um, we bought a studio in Vancouver called Mainframe, which is a CG studio. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, what that company needed to do to do well um, was different than what I wanted to do to do well. Um, their plan is great. Uh, um, you know, I think they'll be continue to be very successful, but I wanted to sort of get back to my roots of finding great creators who are super commercial, but nobody else realizes they're commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, that's sort of my stock and trade is discovering young talent and helping them fulfill their dreams while at the same time making audiences really happy. So Fred Films is really an extension of most of the work that I did uh, over the years at Frederator Films. Um, we have a broader animation mandate in terms of audiences. Um, instead of just kids, you know, Frederator started moving into the adult arena 
in our sort of crossover with Adventure Time and then really, you know, full bore with the R-rated Castlevania. Yeah. And what that's done is really sort of open the aperture for us to take all sorts of different approaches to animation um, as long as it's great. Uh, so that's what Fred Films is all about. We just announced, I don't know, two months ago or something like that. And we're um, balancing what has been a, a really great influx of wonderful possibilities. Yeah, that sounds wonderful, especially since you were saying that you wanted to get back into your roots, which was to find up and coming people to showcase whatever works that they have so that they can be able to have the potential to broaden out with their works. And I think that that's fantastic because... I think that nowadays, uh, I even spoke about this with Spike Spencer, the voice actor, um, that COVID-19 has really affected the industry in a lot of ways, where a lot of people, they can now be able to work from home. And um, they, I mean, there might even be a chance that, um, I'm sure that when you were like, um, doing the stuff when you first started, it's like, okay, you need to go to New York or LA or Texas or Canada or wherever that you need to go to in order for you to be in the industry. But nowadays, I think that with opportunities like this, they can be able to showcase their stuff anywhere. And I think that that's wonderful. Yeah, no, listen, I think that the world started cracking open uh, with the advent of YouTube in a big way, even before YouTube. The internet allowed us to communicate in a much wider way across the globe rather than really just being focused on who's in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, over the years, things have become more and more centered in Los Angeles than ever before. Yes, there's a little bit in Texas. There's a lot less in New York than there ever was. There's a little bit in Atlanta. But in terms of the United States, it's really about Los Angeles. Right. But not only did YouTube open up the game, but just what we're doing right here with video conferencing, we started, I actually banned telephones from the uh, Frederator offices almost 10 years ago because our West Coast people and our East Coast people were being really snarky to each other over phones and chat. Okay. And so I figured that if we were all looking at each other, nobody could be a big jerk to each other, you know, face to face. They still try, but you know, whatever. But what that really opened up is a much more robust pipeline of talent from all over the world. So right now I'm working on a project with an Australian creator, mm. uh, with a Brazilian studio and two creators uh, in Brazil, a Peruvian CG studio, and I literally, my last call right before this was with a Finnish studio in out of Helsinki. Wow. So all sorts of possibilities have sort of opened up um, in a way that was possibly for, but harder. Gotcha. And, you know, my point of view is every person, especially every person with different backgrounds, bring different creative thoughts to the table and open up what's possible more and more. You know, the, what somebody knows, like having been raised in Finland is completely different than what somebody knows it's been raised in Brazil, no less, you know, in the United States. So to me, that's all really great opportunity. Absolutely. And I think that with different backgrounds, especially since our world has opened up because of the internet, we can be able to experience things that we've never had the opportunity to before, where everything was just so truncated into like, okay, we have this cartoon or we have this film or we have this feature that is specifically targeted for this audience. But I think that because that we're more open than ever before, then seeing all of these different cultures presented is a great way of opening the window to a, a wider world that we never would have thought was possible. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that um, right now, Netflix is really leading the way in animation in presenting more different genres more different possibilities. You know, there, there's an old saying in our business, funny is money. And the reality is, is that most of the most popular cartoons the world over have been comedies over, you know, almost a hundred years. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But we know that, you know, just from our friends in Japan, that there is a whole world of animation that has nothing to do with comedy that can be very popular. And even in kids animation, you know, um, our old friend Elizabeth Ito just launched a show on Netflix that is really special and doesn't fit the preconceptions of what kids animation has to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is fantastic. We were talking with a creator in Mexico City the other day who has just a beautiful idea. He's made some great short films, but boy, they are not comedy. Mm -hmm. And until recently, I would have gone like, this is really great. I'm not exactly sure what to do. And now there's more possibility in that range than ever before. Oh, absolutely. I was just about to ask you that question because I was reading through your article from a few weeks ago where um, you were talking about how Nickelodeon turned down Adventure Time five times and you were also close to, you know, turning it down as well. What would you say would be like your conception of how you pick up a show? Has it changed compared to what it was like maybe a decade or two decades ago in which now a, a whole range of ideas, whether it be from comedy or drama or um, action-packed slice of life can be able to be showcased and it can really gravitate to a general audience? Absolutely. Well, you know, the, the reality is, is that to some degree, I'm market-driven, right? Which is there's uh, uh, my first partner when I was in the music business when I was 19, uh, who was two years older than me. So he was very wise. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, Fred, in this business, you have to have two heads, your head and their head. And at the time, that was really annoying to me because my head was really different than their head, meaning the wider audience, you know, that type of thing. And I was interested in very weird corners of the music business rather than the mainstream. Um, but in animation, you know, when we are going to a network or a streamer to partner with us, the essential ask, aside from you like our show, right, is will you give us a check for millions of dollars? And that's a very hard check for someone to write, as you can imagine. All of us have a hard time writing a check for $100 to somebody, right? No less millions. Right. And so the marketplace is part of the equation that you go through in your head. And, you know, by the time uh, Penn Ward came and pitched Adventure Time to us, we had had a bunch of success. I had at all of those Hanna-Barbera shows, Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, the Powerpuff Girls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Frederator all had already had uh, Fairly Odd Parents, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Chalk Zone. So when Pitch, when Penn came in, I made the cardinal mistake that executives make, which is I thought that I knew something. And the reality is if I was so smart, why wouldn't I just be coming up with the cartoon myself? But as you know, my point of view has always been creators first. And honestly, one of the things that I think that really hit me when Penn pitched Adventure Time, I turned it down almost immediately. You know, we went into my office afterwards and I said, well, you know, we're not gonna do that. He's one month out of school. He can't really draw cartoons, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And luckily my two colleagues sort of wouldn't let me out of the office until I uh, cried uncle. And they basically busted me by saying, well, you know, you really laughed in that pitch. And most of the time when you're laughing, it's a fake laugh. And these, these were real laughs. Yeah. And I was de definitely busted. And I said, you know, you're right. Let's give it a flair. You know, we were doing 39 shorts at the time. This is one of 39. Most of them probably won't go anywhere, but let's see, let's see what can come up from this because it definitely is different, but at the same time, it's funny. And so I really disabuse myself from the fact that my opinion means anything, especially at that point, I was getting older, you know, I was getting that many more years away from the audience and my instincts were different, you know, like my personal favorites when I watch television is I watch crime dramas, 
I watch cop <laughs> dramas. I love that stuff. So does right? my dad. <laughs> there you go. I guess there's something about being old. So, you know, I have to be careful because the other thing is that comedy is incredibly generational. Like my 25 year old likes all of the good comedies. And whenever he shows me a comedian or something like that, I'm like, I watch 10 minutes. I go, really? That's not so funny. You know, but my parents were the same way when I thought, you know, I was maybe early college when SNL came out and I thought this was hilarious. And I said to my parents, oh, you know, you should watch this show. And they looked, they said, that's not funny, you know, because they were a different generation and that's how comedy kind of works. So sure enough, more and more, I brought younger and younger colleagues into my puzzle. You know, my current development colleagues, one of them is in her early 30s and another one is 22. And that's the way it should be because they are closer to the pulse of what the audience is than I'm ever going to be. I can spot a talented person, but I'm less good at spotting their execution. You know, like, you know, you have an instinct when you meet people and you see their work as to, you know, what kind of talent they have, but then you have to execute. And I'm not always the best person to judge a contemporary comedy execution. The same way if I was in the music business, I'm not the person to judge uh, a great record in this day and age. You know, a record that you like, a record that I like, don't probably resemble each other most of the time. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. That's what makes, you know, things wonderful is different people's opinions and, you know, doing all that. So that's what happened with Adventure Time. It was the beginning of my going through a shift of having to weigh the opinions of my trusted colleagues around me rather than just my own. Yeah. And, you know, that to me, that has worked, you know, incredibly well over time. Castlevania was another one where when my colleague Kevin Coldy came to work at Frederator about 15 years ago, he already had the rights to Castlevania. He said, you know, this isn't what you do. It's not kids comedy. But I know Kevin for almost 30 years. I knew he was special. He loved video games. I could care less about video games, you know, and he loves dark. He loves horror. I'm like, look, if you think that that's something I believe in you, I don't have to, I don't have to understand the property. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Castlevania was one of those projects, just like Adventure Time. It took us 10 years to find a partner network on it. Nobody understood what we were talking about. And nobody was going to take a chance on an R-rated horror cartoon. Especially one based off of a video game. Exactly. Um, Most of the executives we were talking to had no idea what a video game was. You know, um, and, you know, sure enough, after 10 years, the executives got younger. They had personal experience in the video game space. Honestly, for Netflix, Castlevania was still an experiment, you know. And in fact, I will tell you just, you know, the business deal that we cut was definitely in their favor because it was an experiment for them. Yeah. But I was willing to mortgage my house on the bet, which I did. And we know the result. It's an amazing show. Mm -hmm. Um, The new season is about to come out soon. Um, You'll probably hear an announcement about it. Maybe by the time uh, this goes up on the air. Um, And it's exciting because Kevin has a unique and special vision. And even though he himself is not an animator, he's not a writer, but he has vision and he has talent and he has skill. And we've seen the results with it, with uh, Castlevania. It is like nothing anyone in America has really seen before. Yeah, there have been a few attempts of animated incarnations of video games, but they've either strayed far away from it or they're too in line with it that it doesn't well, really make a good story. When Kevin first told me about Castlevania, I said, so why are you so interested in this? He goes, well, I hate all of the movies that have been made from video games. And I don't blame him. Right. And he said, I'm determined to make the best one ever. I'm like, sure, we all are, you know, and I was like, whatever, you know, whether it's going to be the best or whether it's going to be very good, like who knows. And over the 10 years that we couldn't find a partner, 
I figured, well, somebody else is going to do something that's special. And believe it or not, in those years, nobody did anything special. <laughs> so by the time Kevin released this, and, you know, it is now, I think, pretty pretty much everyone is in agreement. This is the best video game adaptation ever. It is. And thank you. I will uh, pass that on to Kevin because he had a vision, like I said, and he had the talent to execute that vision. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, as somebody who, who actually knows about the timeline of Castlevania, where it's definitely one of the earliest in the timeline, where it, it harkens back into Castlevania 3, where you get to mm -hmm. focus on um, Trevor and you get to focus on uh, various other characters who are in the game. And it spawns over to others in the franchise, such as Symphony of the Night, which is also a fan favorite in the series and Rondo of yep. Blood. So, yeah, it, it definitely does have this really familiar aspect for those who are fans of it but at the same time for those who don't even know about it which is going to be the general audience they yeah, can exactly. be able to get into it it feels akin to something like helsing or it feels something um like maybe resident evil where they can be able to say okay i'm very uh familiar with the atmosphere and the characters i'm not familiar with the story and all that but i want to watch it because it interests me so i think that's probably the one of the most difficult things to do is that you i mean it it's like you were saying before about like you want to make it commercial and a lot of people are saying well i i would like things to be experimental which that's perfectly fine you know i also like experimental stuff as well but sometimes you want to be able to draw in everybody you want to be able to say okay yes this is specifically for the fans but you want to make everybody tune in because they're going to be the ones who are going to be tuning in on a weekly basis. I mean, fans, you know, you know, um, or, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say, uh, there was this really interesting analogy that I once read about, um, you know, the difference between like a mainstream hit and uh, a cult classic hit where people compared it to like uh, wine and water, where they're saying, you know, people, they drink wine, but everybody drinks water. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can like something that's very sophisticated and very heart uh, warming, like a uh, very action packed, very impactful. But then there's something that appeals to everyone, whether it be like its humor or its characters or its story or animation or whatever. It's always characters. Yeah. It's always characters. First, second, and third, it's always great characters. And in fact, Kevin's decision to make Castlevania with Warren Ellis, who wrote the original script and stayed with the show all the way through the series, he knew that Warren was an expert at characters. Mm -hmm. And though someone like you, who's so familiar with the game, could understand that those little eight big figures represented characters, there's a difference between representing a character and being a character. Yeah. And Warren is the guy who really figured out how to really put flesh and blood on those bones and really make it work. The other thing I think that is um, really, really uh, critical to all this is understanding that you can be very rarefied and artful and really popular at the same time. You sure. can be experimental and popular. You know, I bore people to death constantly with telling them that my life changed when the Beatles came to America when I was 12 years old. And one of the biggest takeaways I got from the Beatles is the day that they realized that they could be top of the pops, make millions of dollars, and be crazy and artful at the same time. Yeah. And that's been my watchword all the way through all of the different pieces of my career is how to do both. And as I say to my uh, new colleagues now, the only thing that we're interested in at Fred Films is shows that we have to make, not shows that should be made by somebody, but shows that we have to make. Yeah. And that means that we, everybody in our business says no more than they say yes, but we say more no more often than most, because if we don't have to do it, you know, um, we have sort of a yes pile, a no pile, and a maybe pile. And as far as I'm concerned, if it's in the maybe pile, it's in the no pile. Yeah. You know, because those aren't things we have to do. We have to be completely artful and we have to be completely popular at the same time. 
And I don't see a conflict with those things. I can understand that, especially if fads come and go so quickly. And sometimes if something new comes along and you're hesitant on picking it up, you never know if today's fad could either be, you know, the yes, you know, today's standard, or it could be yesterday's, um, you know, popular thing. And then it's not popular anymore. So it's very, I've hard been to saying say. for years, I've been saying for years that it's impossible for me to follow a trend. And the result has been on occasion, we create a trend. And I'd much rather be on the creating the trend side than following. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, going back a little bit to that Adventure Time story that you were saying, one of my favorite things that you said it in that interview was how one of your sons was just so sick and tired of all the cartoons and movies that were out because he felt it was the same. And then your younger son, where he was putting up his fist and he was saying, what time is it Adventure Time? Because the pilot meant a lot to him. I'd like to know an update on that. So what has been the update since then? On my kids? Yeah, on, you know, there, well, I mean, you know, did your son finally find, you know, movies or shows that like impacted him? Or did your other son watch Adventure Time? I'm actually curious. Sure. So they were nine and 11 when that happened. Yeah. And it was the 11 year old who thought he knew all that, you know, as you do when you're 11. <laughs> um, so fast forward, the show came out uh, when he was 14, a freshman in high school. And so the day before it launched, I said, Joe, Listen, be prepared. You're going to hear a lot about Adventure Time at school. And he goes, Dad, high school kids don't watch cartoons. I said, okay, whatever you say. He came home furious because one of his closest friends had just filled his FaceTime feed with everything Adventure Time all the time. And sure enough, within a few months, he was asking me, for uh, any kind of merchandise we had that he could give to his girlfriend as a present, um, and which is great. Uh, fast forward, he is probably one of the biggest fans of Castlevania. You know, just thinks it's amazing. Can't figure out how his old man had anything to do with it um, because he knows that I'm not a video game guy. I'm not a horror guy. Um, I, I let him know, which he already knew, I'm a Kevin guy, so that works out okay. The nine-year-old um, always appreciated Adventure Time. Honestly, he watches almost no television except for Survivor. Mm -hmm. um, he is a big video game guy. In fact, he is a video game programmer now. He just graduated from college about 18 months ago. Oh, congratulations. And he, thank you. Um, we feel good about that. Um, both our kids are out. Um, but he is actually programming an indie video game right now uh, out of his apartment in Hollywood. And uh, it's supposed to be released, I don't know, July or August. Okay. They've been at work about three years on it. Um, so he watches very little. He watches a lot more foreign movies than he watches television. In fact, mm -hmm. he doesn't watch any television, like I said, except for Survivor. Um, and he watches a lot of movies. So he's not really in our space one way or the other, though he'll always watch something that we put out and give me an honest opinion, which is great. That's great. I, I'm really happy, you know, um, doing the kind of work that I do can sometimes create a big shadow over your kids. And luckily, you know, my older one, who's the most sensitive about that, he was like eight when the Fairly Odd Parents sort of hit its peak. Uh, in fact, I think at his eighth or ninth uh, birthday party, you know, we had a, a premiere of one of the TV movies that we did. And, you know, it was a huge hit. And one day he was saying something about, you know, whatever it was. And he said, well, you know, I, I don't tell people anymore that you do cartoons. I said, really, why not? He goes, well, you know, people actually want to become my friends so they can meet you. And I, I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm like, thank goodness. You know, just do your own thing, figure out your own life. Don't worry about what I do. And sure enough, he's a physicist today. He has nothing to do with anything resembling what I do for a living, which is fabulous. That's great. Uh, considering that yeah. it's either one of two camps that I've seen or I've, or I've heard in some of the interviews of the actors that I've talked to. It's either that they have 
they have their, you know, their child either gloats about them or they want absolutely nothing to do with it because it's embarrassing. But that's nice that you actually have like something in the middle where um, the kids, they just want to focus on their own stuff and they want to try to distance themselves away from saying, oh yeah, you know, my parent does this and that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I want them to have their own space. You know, everyone else actually, strangely enough, in my family are scientists. And I actually went to college for science um, until I realized that I liked the Beatles more. And I changed my life entirely, like on a dime. And, you know, I don't think my son knew when he became a physics major that he was joining the family business because all of my relatives who are scientists live in Europe. Um, and he doesn't really have, you know, doesn't know them. Right. But I, I think it's great that we all find our own space, go our own way and look at ourselves and what's meaningful to us to make a decision in your life. Yeah, uh, especially. And I just want to let all of our listeners know that it's never too late to find it because um, I decided to go back to school a few years ago because I was just not happy with where I was. I wanted to do something that I personally like to do. I wanted to yep. go into the world of communications. And so I'm in my third year now and I'm going to be turning 35 next May. And wow. I decided, you know what? I mean, I, I, I've been doing these podcasts and these blogs and videos for almost a decade. I want to see if I can be able to just expand that to maybe a full on career. And Fantastic. Of course you can. Yeah, exactly. Of course you can. So for those who are saying, oh, it's too late for me, you know, I've reached a certain age or I can't do it because of this reason. No, you, those are doubts so, that you're putting into yourself. Let me give you a couple tips. I was 40 when I got into cartoons. Wow. I'm 69 years old now and I'm not only starting a new company, but I'm moving 3000 miles away. You know, probably I'll be 70 when I move. Mm -hmm. It is, it's never too late if you can look at yourself, you know, in the mirror and go, now's the time. Uh, I'm a great believer in that. Like what's happening tomorrow is much more interesting than what happened yesterday. Yeah. And also for those who kind of doubt about what you want to do, just follow what you want to do. Because, you know, I mean, sometimes even my my parents are saying, you know, why are you talking about all these like, you know, cartoons and stuff? Why can't you talk, talk about other stuff? And I'm like, well, the reason why is because I like it. And because exactly. I, mean, I, I even met my boyfriend with because of this. And fantastic. Yeah. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, really soon. I mean, maybe we'll you know, go further than that, but we'll see. But you'll, yeah, you'll do what you need to do. Exactly. But the, the point is, is that if you have a love of something that you want to do, then just do it. It's going to be a lot of sacrifice. Don't get me wrong. I mean, whether it be moving to another place or it's going to cost a lot of money, maybe even distancing yourself from people that you know for a long time. If you have that passion that you want to do it and you feel that this is the right step, go for it. Because trust me, I mean, if I would have told myself three years ago when I was working in my crummy job at a warehouse saying, hey, uh, you're going to be able to go to school and you know, you'll be in the honor society. You'll have your name on the dean's list and you're going to be doing great. And I'll be like, I want to go there. So, I mean, I, I was scared, you know, when I first made that jump, but I don't want to be anywhere else than where I am now. You know, when I started my first YouTube business, um, a guy sends us a um, sample of what he wanted to do, um, which was he wanted to make videos about how to do film special effects with the stuff you find in your kitchen, in your garage. It was called backyard effects. Mm -hmm. But his opening to his video is the thing that struck me. He goes, please, please hire me. Get me out of my soul sucking jobs in insurance companies and accounting firms and this and that and the other thing. So we did hire him. It was one of our first hit shows on YouTube. This is, you know, I'm talking about 2007. And he now is happily ensconced in Hollywood working regularly in the film business, um, making films, making commercials, making all sorts of stuff. He is a well-employed person, not doing soul sucking, but doing the thing that he always dreamed of doing. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I'm a big believer. The great thing about show business, whatever we define that is, it's really a business of dreams. It's not only dreaming up of the creative work that you want to do, 
It's dreaming of what you want to do every day in your life. And the truth of the matter is, is in this world, dreams come true, especially, by the way, in the United States, where we have all been raised one way or the other, whether we're conscious of it or not, to be able to make choices that are meaningful to us and that we have the ability to fail, pick ourselves up out of the mud, brush it off and take a step forward. That's not true in every country in the world. You know, in, in, I, have, I have a number of European partners I've had on and off over the years. And one of the reasons that they relocate to the States, they said, you know, in the country that I come from, if you fail, you never get another chance. You know, you're stuck. And here you always have a chance to reinvent yourself. So you're doing it at 35. I did it at 40. I'm doing it again at 69 years old. How great is that? It's fantastic. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, it is amazing. And I think that what's also, also amazing is what you were bringing up about, you know, younger generations being able to pick themselves up after failure because, I mean, I don't know, for, for some reason, general consensus, for, you know, depending on what generation it is, they always look down on like the younger generation saying, you know, you'll never accomplish this, you never accomplish that. And if you don't do this or do that, then you're automatically a failure. But you know, hearing what you said about everybody get, deserves to have more chances than one and everybody can be able to make your dreams come true is actually pretty inspirational for me and sure for a lot of our listeners too. Well, you know, it's inspirational to me. I have to remember it, you know, because you do start to feel like what is with you right now is how things are going to be. And sometimes you got to just sort of shake yourself off, take a cold shower and start over, right? And that's, and again, we are in a place that no matter what our parents say, you know, my, my mom barely talked to me for 10 years when I said I wasn't going to do science anymore. You know, now afterwards, she said, well, you know, I didn't really know what you were talking about. I didn't understand what it meant being a producer. And, you know, look, to be fair, now being a parent myself of, you know, kids in their young 20s. You're scared for your kids. You know, you want them to be okay. And usually what you define as okay is what you already know. And so often what we'll try and do is put our kids in a mold. Um, but when my eight or nine-year-old was smart enough to tell me that he wanted to ignore what I did, I realized how much smarter he was than me. Wow. That's, that's, that's quite something. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it goes to show you that you know, age is not a factor when it comes to wanting, uh, wanting uh, what we want to know, what we want to do with our lives. I mean, that seems to be something overlooked that, you know, you have to be at a certain age or you have to be at a certain point in your life to say, I want to do this, or I want to go there. I want to do that. But I mean, for somebody like your son who said at eight or nine, it's like, I don't want to do what you do. I want to do my own stuff. That's, that's great. That's great. So I'll tell you, you know, I, I, it's like probably 20 years ago now, I heard this great interview with an author who had been interviewing people all around the world who were over 100 years old. Wow. She wrote a whole book about it. And the interviewer said to her, so, you know, is there something in common, you know, between the 100-year-old in Afghanistan and the 100-year-old in Alabama? Did they all eat yogurt? Like, what was it? She said, well, you know, there actually was only one thing in common among all of them, which is they didn't want to talk about what they were doing yesterday. They wanted to talk about what they were going to do tomorrow. And it was the thing that kept them alive over and over again is what they were going to do. And it was, you know, I was, you know, in my 40s then, and it was already a great lesson for really thinking about tomorrow always. And that it's never too late to think about tomorrow. Yeah. You know, which is really exciting um, on every thought. You know, I know that there are times that my family wishes I would retire. You know, they're seeing people all around us that are our age that are retiring. I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, you know, plant flowers or something? Like Play golf? <laughs> I like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't play golf. I don't play anything. I like what I do. 
And I am one lucky son of a gun that I get to do what I like to do every single day. Absolutely. If, if you love doing what you're doing, even if uh, you're at retirement age, as they say, why stop? I mean, exactly. we're, always, we're always learning. We're always progressing. No matter how old that we get, there's always new opportunities out there and we have the chance to reach it. So why stop? What, one of my colleagues says, we know there are always new stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And so our business is a renewable resource because there's always a new story to tell. Not only is there always a new story to tell, but there's new opportunities out there to get. Even And even if there's new stories to tell, or maybe there, it's the same story, but it's told in another perspective, which makes it which new. Is, you bet. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So I, I guess we'll just want to wrap things up. So I, I just want to say regarding about your new company, Fred Films, I hope that things continue to go well for you. I hope that you're able to uh, reach out to new people who want to be able to create new stuff. And I hope that you can be able to reconnect with your roots and being able to showcase to people that, you know, creativity and the opportunity for people to be creative is still out there. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, I am a lucky person that creative people ever want to work with me because I'm really here for them. You know, I tell everybody, we don't have anything that we want to do. We just want to do what you want to do. And what that does is it opens up new vistas for us, you know, pretty much every day where people come in and smash our expectations of what we thought we were going to see and always excite us with the thing we're going to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I just want to thank you so much for coming on by, Fred. I really do appreciate it. Patricia, uh, thrilled to be here again. I'm glad you're still doing it. And I hope you're going to stay in touch for me as long as you can. Absolutely, for sure. Okay. So uh, yeah, uh, let people know where they can find you at. Uh, Fredfilms.com. That'll tell you everything you need to know. All my contact information is there. Everyone should feel free to get in touch. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I got a Tumblr, but I think fredfilms.com is the place where, you know, is the hub of finding everything that we do. Okay. And as for me, uh, oldschoollane.net, you can find me on YouTube, uh, which is youtube.com slash oldschoollane, facebook.com slash oldschoollane. I'm on Twitter at Patty underscore B underscore Miranda. I have a lot of podcast venues. I have Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, Overcast. Um, I post my podcast there first. I post it a few days on YouTube. And uh, I post as much as I can content every week so that you can be able to tune in and listen to myself and various special guests discuss about various topics. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. I hope that you have a good day. Hope to see you around soon and take care.